I'm a biologist and paleontologist. I studied uh, biology and paleontology at the University of Tübingen. And my special field of expertise is fossil insects. So I made a PhD thesis on fossil dragonflies. And that was basically my interest from early childhood. So I was interested in nature, I collected fossils and collected butterflies and so on. For most time of my life, I didn't doubt it. So uh, I worked for uh, many years as a mainstream evolutionary biologist and worked for 17 years as a curator for amber and fossil insects at the Natural History Museum in Stuttgart. And then I was responsible for a large exhibition for the Darwin Year celebrations in 2009. And there I came into contact because we had a module in this exhibition on intelligent design and creationism. And there we showed some books and I had to buy these books for this exhibition. And I thought, well, let's, let's have a look in the books. And there I encountered some arguments. Uh, I was quite surprised that the arguments were much more sophisticated than I expected. And first read them, discovered they have some merit, tried to refute them, couldn't refute them, became more and more critic myself. And after a longer process, uh, became an uh, intelligent design proponent. And the arguments were uh, partly not from my own field of expertise, so arguments uh, concerning the unlikelihood of the origin of life, uh, the origin of the first replicator, for the, the search space problem, how to get to new proteins, where, where you have this kind of needle in a haystack problem. And, but then uh, suddenly uh, it was like a barrier was moved away from my eyes and I saw all the problems for Darwinism in my own field. So the, all these discontinuities in the fossil record that I simply overlooked before because I, I was not supposed to see them. So uh, that are some of, of the arguments that made me doubt Darwinism. Now it depends how you define uh, transitional fossil. If you define transitional fossil in the way that most evolutionary uh, biologists would define it, there are fossil forms that have some characters of the supposed ancestor and some characters of the supposed descendants. Then there are indeed a lot of those fossils that are morphologically intermediate. But what most people who criticize Darwinism really mean with intermediate fossils is a fossil lineage that shows a gradual transition from one form into the other. And that is something that you indeed don't find and you consistently don't find it in all groups over all geological eras. Uh, groups appear abruptly, there are discontinuities everywhere and you don't see this gradual development that would be predicted by the Darwinian process. So there are forms like Archaeopteryx and it's not only Archaeopteryx but you find it basically in every group which are morphologically intermediate but these groups themselves appear abruptly in the fossil record. So many people may think that the Cambrian explosion is the, the only example where you have this sudden origin of new body plants, but actually that's a general pattern. You find it even before with the so-called Avalon explosion, where this alien-like uh, pre-Cambrian Ediacaran uh, biota arose. Nobody knows what they are of animals or plants. They appear suddenly without precursor, then they die out, then suddenly you get in the Cambrian explosion the animals. And this continues, and then you have in the Ordovician uh, event that has been called Life Second Big Bang, uh, the great Ordovician biodiversity event. And then the same happens with the appearance of uh, mammals, uh, appearance of birds, uh, appearance of flowering plants, appearance of land plants and so on. So each group appears with these kinds of events and it's not for nothing that even the mainstream evolutionary biologists term these events the so-and-so revolution or the so-and-so explosion. And uh, it's because they are so discontinuous and, and uh, you don't find this kind of transition from an ancestor to a descendant in the fossil record. Yeah, so of course one thinks about uh, the question, if it is not this gradualistic Darwinian process, what could be the explanation? Could there be another naturalistic explanation or has to be there some other mechanism that is not naturalistic. So evolutionary biologists 
mostly start to recognize that there are problems with neo-Darwinism. Now they search for other processes. There's this whole search for an extended evolutionary synthesis with uh, stuff like Evo Devo and niche construction and so on. I think that all those approaches fail to solve the, the explanatory deficits of, of Darwinian evolution. And personally, I think there is a clear indication from the evidence that you needed infusion of information from outside of the system. And then, of course, it depends. Uh, that is as far as science can go. And then, of course, it depends on your background, metaphysics, and your personal beliefs, if you think it were aliens or if it was God. Or, but there had to be some kind of intelligent source of information from outside of, of the system, outside Earth, maybe outside nature. So intelligent design, in my view, has nothing to do with religion. Uh, it's a purely scientific, methodological research program, and it is used in a lot of fields where it's totally uncontroversial. So for example, if an archaeologist uh, goes into a cave and finds scratch marks, and he will ask, is it scratch marks from a cave bear? Or is it uh, scratch marks from a Neanderthal who counted uh, tools or something? Uh, there he uses intelligent design reasoning. How do I distinguish? Is a certain phenomenon caused by uh, chance or natural law or a combination of it? Or was it caused by an intelligent agent? And there are certain criteria. And one criterion is the unlikelihood of the event. Are the probabilistic resources of your system, of the universe, sufficient that it might have happened by chance? Or uh, uh, did you need something else? And if, if you not only have a very unlikely event, but the unlikely event also matches an independent pattern. For example, DNA is very unlikely, the sequence, but it also matches an independent pattern. It has to code for proteins. This is always an uh, indication for intelligent activity. We know this is not a god of the gap argument. We know it by our uh, everyday experience that information has an intelligent source. So I think this is a clear research program we use it in forensics to find out did someone die by natural causes or was he murdered we use it in the SETI research program are signals from stars just radio signals from a quasar or is an intelligent civilization sending us the prime numbers as code and the same you can use for biology and there it suddenly becomes controversial and it's a not allowed uh, a hypothesis <music> The two, uh, many evolutionists will say there is no difference between microevolution and macroevolution. They will say macroevolution is simply a lot of microevolution over a long period of time. Microevolution actually is a phenomenon we can observe in the lab. That's, uh, for example, development of drug resistance in some uh, bacteria or a mutation arises in the population and then selection is working and it spreads. Macroevolution is addressing these major transitions in, in the history of life where suddenly you had not only single cell, but then you have multicellular life. First you had prokaryotes, then you have eukaryotes. First you have dinosaurs, then you have dinosaurs or birds with feathers and so on. Or you had uh, tetrapodous animals and some, uh, suddenly you have whales uh, with very sophisticated organ systems. That would be macroevolution. And most most evolutionists would say, well, we can observe microevolution and we have these long millions of years of time and then we just have to multiplicate and a lot of micro gives macro. But we can meanwhile mathematically show with the apparatus of population genetics that even these millions of years are not sufficient to add up microevolution to get the transitions of macroevolution. <laughs> A research project I'm currently working on is a so-called waiting time problem and, and that would immediately uh, address this issue of could microevolution be extended to, to macroevolution. What we do there is to unite two fields which are usually considered to be good evidence for Darwinian evolution. One is the fossil record where people would say, well, the fossils prove the transitional forms and these long periods of time. And microevolution you can observe in the lab, this Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection, and then take both together and you have the whole story. But if you actually really combine the evidence and you take the windows of time that are established by the fossil record, if you follow the mainstream dating of the fossil and so on, and take this at least for the sake of the argument as granted, and then use 
microevolution and the formula apparatus of population genetic and you calculate could in an ancestral population a certain mutation appear there, there are two waiting times that you need a, a mutation has to appear in the population and it has to spread in the population and this can be calculated and then you have certain numbers you can put into this calculation, population size, generation time, mutation rates. And what we consistently find when we do this is that you need in the models, and models of course always are simplified, we need 10 times more time than is available in the fossil record. If we really take empirical data, and this has been done with malaria, and if you transform this into what would have taken to get the same mutation in humans, you get uh, times uh, longer than the lifespan of the whole universe for a single coordinated mutation in vertebrates. So showing that the Darwinian mechanism cannot work mathematically. Mm -hmm.